ahead and go to John chapter 17 tonight. John chapter 17. And we're getting close to getting through the book of John. I've really enjoyed it. I've been getting a lot out of it. And uh, this, chapter 17, uh, this is where we see a prayer that Jesus is making. And this prayer, I think it's kind of interesting because um, I think chapter 16 and 17, they, just, they go right together. And if you remember last week, I showed you how John 16, it kind of inter- introduces a new doctrine and that's that whole priesthood of the believer thing. We don't have to have an earthly priest anymore. We don't, we don't need one of those. We have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. He is our high, he's our high priest. And he's the one that we go to. He's the one we pray to. He's the one we confess our sins to. You know, we, Jesus Christ is all those things for us. And when Jesus Christ went to the cross, I mean, he was, I mean, literally doing the whole work of the high priest. In the, in the Old Testament, they had those burnt offerings and things that they would do, the high priest would do, but they would actually sacrifice a lamb where it's like when Jesus goes to the cross, he's doing the role of the high priest and he's doing the role of the sacrifice himself too. I mean, he's just doing all of it. He does, he does everything. And so it's right here though in chapter 17, when you read this prayer, we kind of see Jesus acting as an advocate, acting as a high priest. And what we see him doing here, I believe in this chapter, is really what he does for, it's what he's doing for us now. Because even now, you know, we are still sinful. We still have these sinful bodies and God in heaven is still holy. And here we are, you know, we're saved, but, but we sin. So how can things remain good between us and God the Father? Well, we have Jesus Christ acting as our high priest, doing these things for us. And so let's go ahead and start reading in verse 1 of John chapter 17. It says, These words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify thy son, that thy son also may glorify thee. As thou hast given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. I'm going to stop right here because this verse right here is a verse that Calvinists like to use to prove Calvinism or to prove limited atonement. They will take that and where it says that he should give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him. Okay. And so what they'll do, they'll take that verse and say that, you know, right here, you know, the only ones that are going to get saved. Yeah, Jesus died for the whole world. Yeah, I know John 3.16, unfortunately, is in the Bible. But at the same time, you know, the only ones that could get saved are the ones that the Father has given him. The ones that the Father has chosen. There are those who were chosen before the foundation of the earth. And, you know, those are the ones who get saved. Those that the Father has chosen those who the Father has chosen to regenerate, and, they, and they'll use this verse. I, I've had them use this verse to me before. But once again, you know, sometimes we've got we've to zoom out. We've got to look at the big picture. You've got to look at the full context. And Baptists, and, you know, and, and all, Baptists, we do this too. And on all false religions, they, I say this all the time, they just zero in on one phrase and they run with it. They'll say, look at that phrase. This is what that means, and they'll run with it. Well, let's let the Bible define itself. And so when he says that, you know, I'm, tell, I'm going to show you, this does not prove limited atonement, okay? So, and uh, right, go back to chapter 1 of John. So it says the only one, so you can say that he's going to give eternal life to as many as thou hast given him, okay? And let's look at some other verses in John to show what that means, what that's talking about. It says in verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Okay, now verse 13 is another verse the Calvinists will use. No, you're not, not born of your own will. You're born of the will of God. And we, but we see here, if you read more than just that one verse, that it was the will of God that all who believe would be saved. Okay, that was God's will. 
Those were the ones that God gave Christ those who would believe. Okay, that's what when in what he's talking about in verse two. Those that the Father had given him. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world, but the only ones that the Father were going to give him were those who would believe. Okay, but you can't take that and then say, well, God picked them. And I'll show you here too in chapter one that that is not what happened. Because look at verse, verse 11 and 12 prove that he came to everyone and was offered to everyone. Verse 11, he came unto his own and his own received him not. And many people mistakenly, they'll use that verse too when it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. They'll use that, and I've probably done it before too, to say that's talking about the Jews. You know, the Jews were his own, you know, because Jesus was a Jew and they were a Jew. But if you look at what it's been talking about here, it says he was in the world and the world was made by him and the world knew him not. You know, it's talking about the whole world. Everybody that's on the world, you know, came from God. And he came unto his own and his own received him not. And I, I believe, you know, they're all his, but not everyone received him. I don't, I don't think it's appropriate to just apply that to the Jews, but it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. So right here we see that he came to people who didn't receive him. So how can you say that's limited atonement right there? It sounds to me like he came for everyone, but his own received him not. Okay. How do you receive something? Okay. You just take it. Okay. How, and how can you take something unless it was offered to you? Y'all see that? Not everyone offers or accepts the free gift of salvation, but it's offered to everyone. It was offered to the whole world. And the ones who got eternal life were those who received it. But as many as received him, those who took him, those who accepted him, those who accepted the free gift, those ones, they became the sons of God. And how did they do that? By believing on his name. Not because they were chosen or anything like that. And it says, which were born not of blood. It had nothing to do with bloodline. It wasn't because they were Jews, nor of the will of the flesh. There was nothing about their flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. That was God's will that those who believe would be saved. And so right there, you know, we see that, you know, that does nothing to prove limited atonement. You know, and so how much did it cost those who received him? Okay, how, how much did, those who received Christ, how much did it cost them? Nothing. It was free, right? You know, and so nobody can brag on their works, can they? Because it was free. How much, you know, how did they receive him? By faith. Okay, we're saved by grace through faith. And what is it that determines who receives him? And that's their will. Are they going to take it or are they not going to take it? Are they going to accept it or not accept it? Are they going to have faith or are they not going to have faith? And if only certain people would come, or would have come to Christ, then they would need to specify that any that came, or then why did they specify any that came you would not cast out? Because look what it says. Um, oh, where's that verse? I lost the verse where it says, Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Okay? Why did he need to say that? If only certain people could get saved, okay, then why would he add that verse, him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Wouldn't that mean anybody that comes to me, they will not be cast out? I mean, right there, that proves anyone can come to Christ. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Why do you need to specify that? Because people might think, well, what if this person comes? What if that person's come? You know, what if they're this bad? You know, what if they're, you know, not a Jew, whatever? Jesus said, no, him that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. And so that verse too, I mean, it just absolutely destroys limited atonement. Anyone can be saved. Other, if, if, if it was predetermined, if it was only based on who God had chosen, then why would he say that? He's saying that to make sure it's just real clear. Hey, anyone who comes to Christ, they will be saved. He will not cast them out. So uh, to take verse two of John chapter 17 and use that to prove limited atonement, you're just, you're not taking the Bible in full context. You're not reading the full book of John. That's just, that's not even close. That's a major uh, twist of scripture. Oh, it's John chapter six. Uh, verses 35. Go ahead and turn over there. I want to read that passage to you. 
John chapter 6, verse 35, it says, And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. He that believeth on me shall never thirst. But I said unto you that ye also have seen me and believe not. And, the, the, and all that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. All that the Father giveth me. Proves, you know, it's only, it's God who chooses. But he, right after that, he says, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. In other words, anyone that comes, they're getting in. I'm not going to cast them out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. So it's very clear when you look at the, what the Bible teaches about God's will, it was God's will that those who believe be saved. And, you know, it, it makes perfect sense because, you know, every religion, you know, everybody has some kind of idea, some kind of philosophy about what a person has to do to go to heaven. Most people think it's some kind of good works. You know, you got to achieve some level. You know, you got to repent of your sins. You got to do this. You got to do that. Everybody's kind of got something, but they're all works based. Everything's works based. And the truth is, we are unrighteous. We are unholy. Even on our best day, we're filthy in the sight of God. And it was God's will that just those who believed would be saved. And that's why it's over and over and over again mentioned in the Bible, especially in the book of John, especially in the book of 1 John, that it's about those who believe. Those who believe. That's what God chose. And that's the mystery too. Because, you know, the Calvinists all like to talk about, you know, it, it's this mystery that we can't understand, you know, who God chose and why he chose them. You know, only God can know that. No, the mystery is, you know, how is it that God chose to just save those who believe? That There's no merit in that and just believing on him. You know, there's no accomplishment that we have done in, a, in us just believing in him. And you know what? That's called grace, my friend. That God would just choose to save those who believe without works. That's the mystery. The mystery is not who got it and who didn't. So it is. It's a, it's a major, major stretch. I mean, it's just, it's just, it's, it's downright heresy to, to teach something like that. So anyway, look at what it says in verse 3. And this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Eternal life, it comes, it, right, it comes simply from believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we know God when we believe in the Son. That's why I said, you know, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This, this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God. Okay, how do we get eternal life? By believing on him. This is life eternal that they may know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent the way we get salvation by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what believing in God is believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, um, when, you know, or verse, look at verse four, it says that I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Okay. And Notice that part there because this goes along with something I'm wanting to preach here, uh, hopefully in the near future. But it says, I have glorified thee on earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Okay? Jesus just said, I finished the work thou hast gavest me to do. But wait a minute. Jesus hadn't gone to the cross yet, has he? Okay, whenever we teach that Jesus, you know, went to hell, like it says in the book of Acts, where it says, you know, thou shalt not leave my soul in hell, nor suffer thine only one to see corruption. And in the book of Acts, it flat out specifies that that wasn't talking about David. That was talking about Jesus. And people, they lose their mind when you say that. And it's like, no, when he was on the cross, he said it is finished. But wait a minute. Even after he died on the cross, didn't he have to raise from the dead? Even after he rose from the dead, didn't he have to ascend, ascend to the Father? And even after he ascended to the Father, didn't he eventually have to come back and get us? And after he comes back and gets us, doesn't he have to judge us? And after he judges us, doesn't he have to rule and reign on, uh, come back at Armageddon? And doesn't he have to rule and reign for a thousand years? And after he rules and reigns for a thousand years, doesn't he have to deliver up the kingdom to the Father? You know, and then after that, who knows 
you know, eternity after that. There's lots of things to come and people, they lose their minds when you say that because no, on the cross, he said it is finished. But wait a minute. Actually, before he went to the cross, he says, I finished the work that thou gavest me to do. So what's going on here? What, what, you know, what is he talking about? Well, you know, there's two possibilities. It's, you know, one, he had finished what he had been assigned to do at that particular phase of his mission. Okay, John chapter 19, verse 30, because here we see it in John chapter 19, verse 30. And when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Okay, so wait, we've got, I finished the work here in chapter 17, but then he goes to the cross and says it is finished later. Why? Because at the point he was at, when he is saying that prayer, he had finished what he was supposed to do. Many times, even in our own jobs, we have different things we're assigned. Okay, you know where I work, they, uh, you know, we've we, uh, in order filling. You know, I'll, they'll give me my last trip, and when I finish with that trip, you know, I am finished order filling. But there's things I have to do, other things I have to finish before I leave. You know, there's other phases to what I do. There's other uh, phases in my job, and Jesus Christ, before He goes to the cross. There were things that God wanted him to do before that, and he finished those things. And when he was on the cross, he finished paying for our sins, but there are still things that he had to do, things that, you know, he still had to die. When he said it is finished, was he dead yet? No. But he was, you know, and, you know, and it's interesting that mentions after he had received the vinegar, you know, then he said it is finished. Maybe, I don't know, this is just my opinion. Maybe it's because it was prophesied. I believe in the book of Psalms that they would give him vinegar to drink and he needed to fulfill that prophecy. And so there he did. I mean, he filled so many prophecies when he died on the cross that night and maybe that was the last one. And so it is finished and he gave up the ghost. And so, you know, that, you know, just a terrible argument right there. Whenever people throw that in your face, just show them John chapter 17 and verse four. And so, uh, but you know, another possibility too, you know, he had, uh, we see in, uh, turn over to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 1. Here's another possibility. Because he said, it is finished. There, he said, it is finished at the cross. And in Hebrews chapter 4, in verse 1, it says, let us, there, uh, let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left of us, entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. Talks about the works being finished from the foundation of the world. You know, if, if we will enter into his rest, well, how do we enter into his rest? Okay, we enter into his rest by ceasing from our labors. We see that later. By ceasing from our labors and trusting in the work of Jesus Christ. And those of us who are saved today, we spiritually are living the Sabbath day because we are resting from our labors. We are not working for our salvation. We are trusting in his work. We have entered into his rest. And you know what? The works were finished from the foundation of the world, the Bible says. In Revelation, you're not going to turn, turn over there, uh, but in Revelation chapter, um, lost my spot, uh, 13 verse 8, talks about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So maybe that's what he was talking about. But wait a minute, it hadn't happened yet. He hadn't done it yet. But listen, God, if God's word said it's been done, it's been done. Even it hasn't happened yet. And I'm not in heaven yet. I don't have my glorified body yet, but I can still be called the Son of God just because of the fact I believed on His name and therefore nothing, 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 nothing can change the fact that I am saved and I am going to be like Christ one of these days. And God often speaks as of things that are not as though they were. I think I got that mixed up. I got to get that memorized. Total, totally butchered that verse. But y'all know which one I'm talking about. I, I bring it up all the time. He speaks of, of things that I can't remember. Anyway, I'll, I'll, I'll work on that one. If y'all remember that one, uh, send me that or tell me that verse. But anyway, 
So, you know, right there, you know, t I think uh, when he says it is finished, you know, he's just kind of finished that phrase. And if you don't like that, well, fine, you know, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Nothing was going to change the fact Jesus was going to get the job done. And so uh, e either way, uh, people who use the fact that Jesus said it is finished on the cross to, you know, discount what the Bible says in Acts about Jesus going to hell. Uh, that's just a foolish, foolish argument. So look at verse five. It says, and now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto, unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou gavest them me, and they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are of thee, for I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. So the, you know, the goal of Christ we see here, it was always to bring glory to the Father. And that was, and we see all, multiple references to that in the Bible. I mean, he wanted to glorify the Father. He wanted to do the will of the Father. The way we glorify God, it's not just by saying glory to God. It's not just by doing lip service. When we do the works of the Father, when we do the will of the Father, that's how we glorify God, when we do God's will. Many people, whenever they're faced with a difficult situation and you know, it appears you know, they're tempted to sin in order to make something happen, you know, what they'll, they don't realize that when, uh, you know, the, the way to glorify God in that situation is to trust him and do what he says, no matter what, that's how we glorify God by being obedient to him, obeying his commandments, even when it looks like it's, it's not going to work. And the, so the only difference between the saved and the lost are the saved hear the words and receive them and the lost don't hey, look what it said there again in verse eight. For I have given unto them the words which thou gavest me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came out from thee, and they have believed that thou didst send me. That's the only difference between the saved and the lost. Hey, and listen, we could point out some things in our lives, maybe some of us, where we're better than a lot of lost people. You know what? I'm regularly convicted at people I come across. There's some people, there's there's one individual I can think of that I work with. That he is not, he makes no claims to be saved, but he is just one of the nicest people I know. He could go walk into any church and everybody would consider him this godly individual because he's got such a great attitude, a great spirit. He's, I mean, he's got probably one of the best work ethics I've ever seen in my life. I mean, and the, and the guy's got like, the, he's got like the best testimony in the place. I mean, I've never heard anyone say a negative word. Well, I think one person one time tried saying something negative about that guy. And like, everybody was like, you're an idiot. Nobody, nobody was buying anything negative against the guy. It was like, they're, they're, this guy's saying something bad about him? And I was like, that, whoever, you know, I was like, they're an idiot. <laughs> you know, I was like, there's, there's no way. And I'm con I get convicted by that. It's like, man, I wish all Christians acted like this guy. Who doesn't even claim to be a Christian? I mean, we do. We make such a big deal sometimes about our lifestyle, you know, that it causes us to start thinking that our life, our actions, our works are proof that we're saved. But we're still sinful in the eyes of God. And you know what? That guy that I work with, if he does not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will go to hell. And some of these sorry church members that are just, you know, can't get their life in line. They have no character, but they have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. They will go to heaven. And you know what? A lot of people see that and say, that's not fair. But listen, what's the difference? Where in the Bible, nowhere in the Bible do you see the difference is the works. It's always the faith. And that good guy with no faith, he will not go to heaven. And that bad person in the church who has faith, they will. And once again, there's a mystery right there too. But that is exactly what the Bible teaches. That is exactly what the Bible teaches. It's all over the place. It's by grace through faith. You got to have faith and it is without works. And so, uh, you know, and notice how, you know, Jesus, he didn't say anything to God when he's talking about them too. When he's talking about those who had received him and had received his word. It's interesting how Jesus never said anything about their changed life. You know, Lord, look at how these disciples have changed. You know, look at how different they are. No, they still weren't very good, were they? 
They were all just about to abandon him. Peter was about to deny him three times. And right there, Jesus, he's not talking about their changed life. Jesus didn't talk to the father about how they had repented of their sins. He didn't mention any of those things. He said, they received my words and they believe me. That's what Jesus brought up. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's crystal clear and you're going to see it in a little bit. It is very clear in the Bible that Jesus wants us to have a changed life. He wants us to be different. He wants us to be holy. That's going to, that's to come. But at the same time, Jesus didn't mention that when talking about their salvation. They receive my words and they believe. That is what makes the difference. So verse 9 says, I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. And all mine are thine, and thine are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, Keep through thine own name those whom thou hast given me, that they may be one as we are. Right here in, uh, you know, in this passage, we see you know, everything that belongs to God belongs to Jesus. Everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to God. And just as Jesus and the Father are one, notice this too. You know, he mentions how you know, they are one, and it says, and it includes us, we who are saved are one with the Father and the Son. And that's and I like that too, because that verse destroys the modalist view of John 10, 30, where it says, I and my Father are one. And people use that to say that Jesus is the Father. Well, right here, we see in this passage where Jesus is saying, you know, I'm one with you, and all that are mine are also one. So, and you and I know we're not God the Father, don't we? We all know that for sure. And so if somebody takes John 10, 30 and uses that to prove that Jesus is the Father, well, then they got to take uh, John chapter 17 and verse 11 and say that we're the Father too. And that's just stupid. All right. So uh, that, that right there, that's a good passage to use to disprove that. And so verse 12 says, While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Those who got saved, he's kept them, okay, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, the son of perdition. He was the only one, but the truth is, Judas was never saved. Okay, Judas didn't lose his salvation. Judas was, uh, he was, he was never saved. John chapter 6 and verse 70, going, you know, go way back to John chapter 6 and, or, uh, not verse 70. Or yeah, verse 70. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil. Okay? This is before Judas had betrayed Jesus. This was before Satan had entered into Judas. Judas was a devil from the beginning. Okay? So uh, I, I believe that uh, you know, this, the verse that we just read, those are good eternal security verses. You know, those that the Father has given Jesus, those who believed, He's held on to every one of them. And you know what? No one's going to be able to pluck them out of his hand. My father, which gave them me, is greater than all. No one is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. How did we get salvation? Okay, there are some people out there who they kind of believe in eternal security, but they believe that we can forfeit our salvation. In other words, we could give it up. I think those are the Arminians that believe that. And the, uh, you know, the, and, but right there, I says, my father, which gave them me is greater than all. No man's able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Well, if God gave us salvation, you know, if we're going to lose that salvation, don't we kind of have to get it from the father? And we can't do that. You know, my father, which gave them me is greater than all. No man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. You're not going to get yourself out of the hand of the father. You can't do that. So uh, eternal security, I, I think all of this helps that. It proves that. And so uh, verse 13 says, And now I come to thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. 
And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through thy truth. So while we're saved without works, it is very clear there's no doubt that God wants us to live clean, holy lives. God wants us to be sanctified through thy truth. Thy word is truth. God wants us to read his word and he wants us to apply these things to our life. He wants us to sanctify ourselves uh, you know, with the word of God. He wants us to let this Bible change us. God wants us to have a changed life. When we get saved, he wants us to be different. Okay? He wants that from us. He expects that from us. We should do those things. But let me tell you, those things don't save you. And they're not proof that you're saved. They're not proof to God that you're saved. It's proof to everybody else that you're saved. But it's not, it, it's not, or it's evidence to everyone else you're saved, but it's not proof to God. And so we see though, uh, you know, Jesus, he was praying to, you know, he's right here, is, we're, we're seeing him, he's doing this act of the high priest for us. He's going to the Father for us. He's praying for us. He prays that, uh, you know, that he would, uh, he said, you know, mentions how we're not of the world, even as he was not of the world. I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but thou shouldst keep them from evil. What's he doing? He's praying that we would be protected from harm. Okay. Evil is not just sin, but it's when, you know, somebody, when, uh, a sin that causes harm. And it's very clear you know, that as believers, now maybe not so much in America, but you know, you're in many parts of the world and in that part of the world, especially during that time, being a believer, it puts you in great danger of evil and people and all the disciples had evil done to them and God allowed it. But you know what? At the same time, Jesus prayed, you know, God would keep him from evil and God does allow uh, difficulties to come our way sometimes, but you know what? When he does, he helps get us through it. He will. He will protect us. And I. And so, you know, thank uh, you know, thank God we have Jesus going to bat for us on that. When things come our way, when harm comes our way, we can rest assured knowing that you know what? Yeah, this happened to me. It was no fun. Or this could happen to me. That wouldn't be any fun. But you know what? Jesus is going to know the whole time what's going on. He's going to be interceding to the Father. And the Father is not going to allow me to go through any more than I can handle. And anything I make it through, I'm going to be rewarded for it. I'll be glad that it happened. And, you know, I think if we knew the rewards that were waiting for us, I think we would be begging for persecution. That's why Jesus said, leap for joy. You know, these Christians that are just whining and complaining because, you know, preachers like us, you know, we talk about the, going through the tribulation. I think if they knew what the martyr's crown was like, they wouldn't be so freaked out at the thought of that. They would be like, man, I hope I get it. You know, I hope I, I hope, you know, I hope I get martyred. I hope I suffer persecution. Do you realize what is coming? And when you know that there, and listen, the Bible doesn't show us, it tells us some about it, but we just got to believe by faith that it will be worth it. Whatever we go through, it will be worth it. You know, what are we going to get? I don't, I don't know for sure. What's that crown going to be like? I don't know. How much is it worth? You know, I, I, I don't know. You know. We all want to know these things. Hey, just trust God. He's going to take care of you on that. None of us are going to get shortchanged. Anything we go through, the worse it is, the better our reward's going to be. So just trust God. Don't, don't worry about that stuff. Don't get freaked out by it. I'm not a bad preacher. I'm not a mean preacher for preaching this. We should get excited about this stuff. And if anything, you know, these Christians that just, you know, are so used to their just easy piece of cake, American Christianity, you know, we ought to be, we ought to be scared to death of the fact that, you know what, we've got it so easy that we are going to be, when we stand before God on judgment day, that it is going to be just the lamest thing in the world. We're going to have like no rewards because we never went through anything. We ought to be more worried about that. Standing before God and not have any rewards because we never went through anything. We never had any challenges. We never faced any difficulties. And, it, and we ought to welcome those things and not be scared of them. And so, uh, but Jesus, so he, is, he's, he was praying for protection from harm. He was praying for protection from sin. And listen, I believe our flesh is a greater enemy than the world. I think we should worry a lot more about our flesh then we should be worried about the world and what it could do. 
I think we would be wise to, to, worry about, to worry about that. And so in the end, though, Jesus gets all the glory for our sanctification. He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word, thy word is truth. He is the one that ultimately sanctifies us. First Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 says, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. It's the Spirit that sanctifies us. Now, So then why does the Bible tell us to sanctify ourselves? Well, do you all understand when we sanctify ourselves, on one hand, it doesn't do anything. Okay? Do you all think you can do enough good stuff? You can clean yourself up good enough that all of a sudden you can go and you can present yourself to God and impress Him? Okay? Obviously, that's absolutely ridiculous. You cannot do that. Okay? What is it that's going to allow us to be able to stand before God and be clean and righteous in His eyes? Well, it's the blood of Jesus Christ. But at the same time, whenever we do try to sanctify ourselves on this earth, when we do try to turn from our sins and repent of our sins, do you all realize when we do all those things, we're doing these things by faith. All right, I trust the word of God. I'm going to, I'm going to, try, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try my best to be like Christ. I'm going to try my best to obey the commandments of God. And that act of faith is what pleases God. Not necessarily the physical thing that we accomplished it was that it was that act of faith, and it's just like that little child sometimes that you know their intentions are good. You know they come in from playing outside and they're filthy, they're all dirty, and you tell them to go clean up, and they go and they go wash their hands. They wash their hands real good, but then you look and all the way up their arms, the rest of the body is still covered with dirt. And you know they th- they think they obeyed you. They tried to obey you. They thought they did a good job. You know. And, you know, as a parent, you don't spank them after that. You know they did their best, all right? You know, but it was a sorry job. And, and so sometimes you have to help them out a little bit. But, at the same, but you're pleased that they at least try to do good. You know, that they, they tried to, you know. Or have you ever seen it too? Maybe you walked into the kitchen and they made a horrible mess. And you saw that they tried to clean it up. And it's like, you know, well, at least they tried, you know. And I don't know if it's like they were trying to clean it up or they were trying to hide the evidence. <laughs> and uh, we've, seen, we've seen that before. And uh, I've got a horrible story I could tell about somebody who made a horrible mess in the bathroom when I was at my dad's church and attempted to clean it up. And you want to talk about a failed attempt. I mean, it was a failed attempt. Too disgusting to describe in church. And I'll tell you right now, uh, that attempt did not cause me to uh, have mercy. It was not good enough. <laughs> It was, it was horrible. I'll tell you, I'll tell some of that story after church if you're interested in hearing a really gross story. But, you know, he said it, but that act of faith, when, whenever we're trying to please God, God knows that he knows our heart. And so we should, we should try to obey the commandments. We should read our Bible and look for stuff. Lord, show me something. What do you want me to change in my life? What do you want me to do and sanctify ourselves? Lord, help me to be more like you. Show me how to act like you. Show me what you want me to do and not do. And so verse 20 it says, neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their words. So Jesus isn't just praying for the disciples here. He said, I'm praying for all those which, you know, after shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Uh, And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them that they may be one, even as we are one, I in them and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So right here, you know, Jesus, he's not just praying for the disciples, but all those who would be saved because of their ministry, because of their word. Okay. Jesus gave them his word, and then they were going to go and they were going to go spread his word, and he called it their word. Those who would believe because of their word, because of their testimony, because of their preaching, and God wanted them all to be one. Okay? And that's one of the problems, too, I have with dispensationalism. They're always separating everybody, aren't they? They're always, you know, you got the bride, the church here, you, know, you got Israel over here, you got God's bride, Israel, Jesus' bride, the church, always separating everything. But we see in the Bible that no, 
Jesus is trying to get all of them one in Him. And He's in the Father. We are all one. We are all one group. And there are, there, when we get to heaven, I know the song, I Can Go In, it talks about all the different groups coming in. You got the martyrs, you got the prophets, you know, you got all these different groups. And then there's this other group, those who are saved by grace. That's stupid, folks. All right. It's a pretty song, but that's just not biblical. All right. Everyone is saved by grace. And we are all one in Christ. And all those who are in Christ are also one with the Father, one group. Okay, one group, one bride, and right there, that passage right there proves it. And we're still in the Old Testament dispensation. And yet he's talking about those that are to come in the New Testament dispensation. You know, it just, just uh, once again, just bad, bad, bad theology that comes from that. And so the, uh, verse 24 says, Father, I will that they also whom thou hast given me be with, uh, be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which thou hast given me, for thou lovest me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee, and these have known that thou hast sent me, and I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. See, the love God has for us is the same love he has for his son. Now, that's pretty amazing right there when you consider how sinful we are. That God would love us the way He loves His Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believeth in Him. You know, we, we all know that verse. God, God loves us and like He loves His own Son. That is an amazing thing. Well, how can that be? Well, it's because we Christ is in us. And that causes us to love Him. And I think, one, you know, a way you can almost compare that is like, you know, grandparents, all right? They automatically love their grandkids, don't they? Why is that? You know, it's not their kids. Yes, but, you know, the ones who begat them were their children. And just like, you know, my children are special to me because they are a part of me. Well, any human beings that come from them are going to be extremely precious to me too. Why? Because they're going to they're a part of my children who I love and they're a part of me. And so you have Jesus Christ who is the son and all of the uh, us who are saved, we have Christ in us. And when God sees that, it pleases him just like when I see those grandkids I hope they all look like my side of the family. You know, I know they're going to look like the other side of the family too. But you know, the first thing that I'm going to be looking for is the McMurtry in those kids. I I want to see the McMurtry in them. And you know what? Even if there's not much, all right, the littlest thing I see that's McMurtry, it's just going to make me love them like crazy. You, You know, you just, you can't, you're not going to be able to help it. And that's how God is with us. And I, I, will, I believe I will love my grandkids just like I love my children. And I understand that we're not God's grandkids. You know, we're, we're, we're sons of God. But I believe it's a similar thing that we're seeing there because Christ is in us and God, God's going to love us that way. So just an amazing, uh, just a, a great passage of Scripture there that God is going to love us the way He loves His Son. And we, but we know that that love God has for us, it's not because of us, but it's because of what's inside of us. It's because of Jesus Christ. And so th- thank God for him because we are, we're going we're to stand before God one of these days. And if, it, if Christ is not in us, God's not going to love us. He's going to cast us into the lake of fire. And uh, I definitely don't want that to happen to me. So I thank God Christ is in me. And so in chapter 16, we looked at Jesus as our advocate. And we see an example, I believe, in this passage uh, of, uh, in this chapter, of Jesus going to the Father on our behalf. Jesus Christ praying for us, not just for the disciples, but all those who are going to come after. That's us. He was praying for us. And thank God we have Jesus Christ as our high priest. Last verse I want to look at Hebrews chapter 4. It says, seeing then, verse 14, that we have a great high priest 
that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. One of the reasons that, you know, guys, we can just never win sometimes when it comes to our wives is because we don't know what it's like to be a woman. And we can't know what it's like to be a woman because we've never been a woman. And you know what? I don't care what Bruce Jenner says. We can never be a woman. All right. It's just it, it, it can't happen. And what with God, okay, he looks at us in our sin and it's disgusting to him. But, you know, he could the father could not empathize with us the way Jesus can. Jesus, though, there's a difference with him because he became man. He became like unto sinful flesh and he was tempted in all points like as we are. But the big difference between him and us is he did. He was tempted and never sinned. But because of the fact that he became a man made out of flesh, just like us, he is able to be our high priest. He knows what we're going through. He understands. And that's amazing, too, because he does understand. You know, he could have said, you know what? I lived 33 years and I never sinned. Y'all can die and go to hell. He could, have, he could have said that and been completely just in saying that. But he did not say that. He loved us. He had compassion. He had mercy. He paid for our sins. And he is our advocate. He is our high priest with the Father. And we're all good. Things between us and God are good thanks to Jesus Christ. And what a, what a wonderful blessing it is to know that he's got our back. To know that he prayed for us. That he still makes intercession for us. And I don't have to fear going to hell. I don't have to fear messing up and losing my salvation. I have a great high priest, Jesus Christ. And he's, he, will, he will keep me. And I am okay today. because Not because of anything in me other than Jesus Christ himself. And I, he came to me when I did nothing but receive a free gift. When I believed his word, he saved me. So with that, let's all.